Hello, English 101 students. This is Professor Delaney, and we're going to work on textual analysis today. Um, we've done a little work on visual analysis, looking at pictures. Today we're going to talk about words. Um, but as we go through this, I want you to think about how the words and the pictures work together. Um, hopefully this PowerPoint will help you as you're working on your second essay, since you should be looking at both, right? You want to analyze the text as well as the visuals. The first terms I want to give you are denotation and connotation. You may have heard these before. Um, denotation basically means a word's dictionary definition, whereas the connotation is the word's baggage, right? It's history, how it's changed over time, how it makes people feel when they hear it. And that is kind of a subjective term, but in, in large part, people can agree on basically what a connotation is for a particular word. Well, let me give you an example. Um, if we talk about the words aroma and odor, they have the same denotation. They both refer to how something smells, but they have very different connotations. If I use the word aroma, you might think about um, grandma making chocolate chip cookies in the kitchen and how the house fills up with the smell. That's an aroma. It smells delicious. An odor, on the other hand, is gross, right? We don't want to smell an odor. That's like um, if you haven't changed the cat's litter for two or three weeks, that's an odor. Okay, so even though the words mean basically the same thing, you don't want to use them in the same spot. Um, and you would understand their meaning very differently in a sentence. And the same is true with a lot of other words that companies use. Um, for example, we have part of Greenpeace's website here, their section called What We Do, it says we defend the natural world and promote peace by investigating, exposing, and confronting environmental abuse and championing environmentally responsible solutions. You'll see I made the word defend in bold. Um, that's because we're going to focus on that one word choice. Now we know that defend means basically to protect something, right? To keep it safe. Um, but it has this very militaristic connotation, right? That we have something very precious to protect and we're going to defend it with force if we have to. Um, it's very warlike kind of belligerent language that's getting used here in that one particular word and that one connotation. So as you're working on your paper, you want to look at those kind of individual words that pop out, like the word defend, um, and try and figure out what they mean or what they're doing in that part of the business's communication. What's, what are their connotations? Um, other things for you to look at are emotionally charged language, um, and that can be any emotion, right? In the case of this image, we'll look at it in a second, um, it's probably fear. But it could be sadness, it could be happiness, it could be patriotism, there's a lot of things that it could be. Um, but it's basically used when the writer is trying to make you feel, right? trying to get your attention through emotions. And in that case, our big emotional word here is catastrophic. And that's designed to make you very afraid. Catastrophe is something really, really bad. Right. So it's not just saying we could have stopped harmful climate change or inconvenient climate change. It's catastrophic. And that gives readers images of just how drastically the climate could change. And it makes us very nervous. Um, so in this case, they are using um, emotionally charged language to cause fear in the viewers or the readers. But as critical thinkers and people who have studied this, you can start to recognize that and include it in your own analysis. Another thing that might happen is an allusion with an A here. You'll see how it's spelled here. And that basically means a reference right, to a story, a movie, a historical event. We have a lot of allusions from the Bible or from mythology. Um, and basically what an allusion is, is it refers to that other story. So in the image, you see Little Red Riding Hood. Nowhere does that picture say Little Red Riding Hood. We know exactly who she is. And it doesn't say what her story is, right? They're relying on us to know Little Red Riding Hood's story and be able to jump off from that point. So they've saved themselves a lot of time, right? They don't have to explain about a little girl going through the forest. We already get it because she's there. Um, they can jump off at the point where the forest has been totally cut down and go straight to the language you don't want to tell this story to your, to your children, do you? Okay, so an illusion is a really helpful strategy for um, writers of content uh, in that they can save a lot of time and sort of tap into a, a company's or a reader's culture. 
The problem is, of course, if the audience doesn't know the story, then they're going to be missing out, right? If you haven't heard Little Red Riding Hood before, you won't understand this image as well as the students who do. So it is kind of a risky strategy, but definitely an interesting one to analyze in your paper. You can also look at syntax, which means sentence structure, right? How a sentence is assembled. So oftentimes, um, people will use a short sentence for impact and how that could look like having a paragraph made up of many long sentences and then it ends with one short one, that'll stand out to the reader. It's also done um, on websites frequently or in newspaper articles where they have a one sentence paragraph. It's designed to stand out and force the reader to notice it. Um, in this case, they have two different sentences that we're looking at. Humans were once terrified of the sea. Today, it's the other way around. Um, and that is a contrast. Right? There were many ways to express this idea. They could have said, today the sea is afraid of humans instead of humans being afraid of the sea, but it doesn't have the same poetry. So you want to look really carefully at how the sentence is structured and figure out why it might be done that way. In this case, the contrast is designed to make us think a little bit more um, and, and to kind of make the idea beautiful in a way. Right? It, it stands out the way it's worded. Um, the other thing that can be kind of tricky is to look at tone, um, and tone is the emotional weight of the words. It's kind of how you would imagine them sounding if they were spoken out loud. So in the Barack Obama ad, um, a couple slides back, we might imagine a really sad tone. It starts with, I'm sorry, and they talk about catastrophic climate change. It's really sad. Um, this ad here is a little more complicated. It looks to be set up like instructions. And in a business setting, if we see instructions, we expect things to be pretty dry. But this isn't. Right? It says, how to destroy Canada's ancient boreal forest in three easy steps. Step one, pull out a Kleenex facial tissue. Step two, put it to your nose. Step three, blow. And so we can see that this is kind of a sarcastic ad. They don't want us to do that. Right? The organization is Greenpeace. They don't want to destroy forests. Um, so they're using a really sarcastic tone here to try to get their point across. Now, much like an illusion, sarcasm is a risky um, strategy because people don't always get it. But if you know a little something about the organization and you have a good feel for tone, you can detect that it's sarcastic pretty easily. Um, the other thing you want to look at is the persuasive techniques. So how are they trying to convince you of something? Um, in this case, the text is giving you a figure, right? it's giving you statistics. If you and every other household in the US replace just one roll of paper towels with 100% recycled ones, we could save 544,000 trees. Um, but the other thing this does that's really persuasive is they set them up on paper towel counters at the grocery store and they put the paper towels to fit perfectly over the, the circles. So it becomes very personal, right? When a shopper picks up that, that roll of paper towels, he or she understands that they're part of destroying trees. They're not allowed to forget at the grocery store. So both of those things together, the, the logical statistic and the placement of the ad in this case, become part of its persuasive techniques. The other thing you want to look at is the underlying message. Sometimes ads don't tell you straight out what they mean, and this is a really good example of one. Um, it's a travel ad for the Sahara after climate change has really kicked in, where the Sahara becomes sort of a tropical water world, this is not what Greenpeace wants. Right? Um, they signal that by reminding us the planet will change if you don't change. Right? So even though they have really sincere advertisement sounding language about turning the Sahara into a water world, they don't really mean it. Right? The underlying message is this is not the future we want for ourselves. And so um, images like this and text like this can be kind of tricky because it's not totally sincere. That's when it really helps to know something about your organization and pay attention to all the textual clues, including that, that last, the planet will change if you don't change. Um, the last thing we're going to look at is design, how things are laid out on the page. So in this example, it looks like a children's book. It starts with once, so it kind of sounds like once upon a time. It's got a pretty little pencil sketch. Um, kind of reminds me of Make Way for Ducklings, if you've ever seen that book. Um, but the text doesn't really line up with the image. It says, once Mama Bird and Papa Bird were building a nest in the forest. Suddenly, one of the eggs started to hatch. 
So Papa didn't notice the tree that fell and killed them all. And so it's got a really sad message that doesn't fit the children's book layout at all. And I'm trying to draw that kind of contrast for you and, and shock you a little bit. Similar to that little Red Riding Hood image um, several slides back. Um, so one thing to look at are potential disconnects. When does the design of an image not really fit the text? And this isn't a mistake. Right? Greenpeace isn't saying, oh, let's do a fun little children's book and then they do something sad. They know what they're doing here. Um, so it's really helpful for you to see why, when and why those things don't line up properly. We're going to look at a couple sample tweets, um, which is going to line up with your post activity for today. These are both from Greenpeace's account. Um, the first one says, wouldn't it be great if extreme storms were named after climate deniers? So there's a couple things you could talk about if you're analyzing this, this tweet. Um, first is the use of a question. Right? They're not making a statement, they're asking a rhetorical question. Um, they do include a hashtag, which is definitely a strategy that you can talk about because it's designed to line up that tweet with um, other tweets that are also about the climate and make it easier for people to find it. Um, it also sounds positive, but has kind of a negative message. Like, wouldn't it be great? Sounds like it should be a good question. Wouldn't it be great if we all got free ice cream today? Um, but it's actually a really kind of negative question about naming storms after people who are climate deniers. So pay attention to the tone there. In the second one, it says, we need to put an end to this reckless thirst for oil. Join the movement. So there's a couple interesting things happening there. First is the use of the word we. Right? Um, that automatically includes the reader, whether you're a member of Greenpeace or not. Um, Second, the use of the word reckless. It's one of those emotionally charged words. They could have taken it out, right? Or they could have used the word un, uh, unsustainable, but they picked reckless. Um, and then they have a little syntax going on. That last word, join the last sentence, join the movement, is really brief. It's designed to stand out like that. And on their Twitter account, they didn't even have a period there. Um, so it's designed to help you notice it. Okay. Um, so this, this PowerPoint went over a number of different textual analysis strategies that hopefully will be helpful for you in SA2. Um, if you have any questions, do feel free to contact me by email um, or you can make an appointment to see me in office hours. Um, I want to make sure that you feel really comfortable doing this kind of analysis. You should also be using it on today's post, which is going to be about tweets as well. So use some of these strategies to help you today. Thank you have a, and have a good one.